Matt, welcome back to the Jacobin Show. You are now a repeat guest. Uh, we've been saying that you're kind of like our welfare king, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Uh, not not in the literal sense that I am uh, have Cadillacs and food stamps, but uh, right. well, that's what I aspire to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and actually, so on that subject, uh, you recently had a piece uh, which you published on the People's Policy po uh, Project website, uh, but it was also published on Jacobin with the title, Let's Make the U.S. a Welfare Nation. Um, and in this piece, you look at the new child tax credit, uh, which of course began earlier this month, and you show that the, the rollout of this benefit now means that 65% of people in the US live in a household now where at least one person is receiving a monthly check from the government. Prior to this new CTC, it was only 28%. And of course, the monthly check is not just the CTC, but it's things like disability and social security. So I, when I was reading your piece, I thought that the kind of heart of it was that in your piece, you distinguish between welfare benefits and what you call poor people benefits. And of course, in the US, historically, these have been one, one and the same, right? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you argue that the new CTC kind of breaks that link a little bit. So can you talk a little bit about what it does sort of differently? And then following from that, why do we want welfare benefits, but not poor people benefits? Yeah, so I mean, the, the old C CTC was also not a uh, poor people benefit, um, but it was it was also not a very salient benefit. You didn't receive a monthly check. It just kind of got lopped off your taxes in a very opaque way. So now we have something that looks much more like a conventional welfare benefit. It's coming in the account every month. It's a check. Uh, you know, it's very, very conspicuous. And so in that sense, we have this this new welfare benefit in a, in a traditional sense of the word. And what I was trying to point out in the piece is, and, and it might be useful to get a little background on this, there have been these debates in the policy circles for going back to, you know, 15, 20 years, um, including a lot of people on the left and center left who, you know, they would make these claims that people really don't want to receive you know, they don't want handouts, they don't want handouts, they don't want handouts, right? So we need to focus on increasing their wages, or we need to focus on maybe giving them money in ways that are is sort of opaque to them, so they don't feel like they're receiving a handout. Um, and that even poor people don't like receiving handouts, they feel kind of gross about it, nobody wants to be on food stamps, it feels stigmatized, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And so that's kind of been the underlying theory of why people on the left have been so supportive of this sort of tax credit state that we've built. And what I try to point out is that that whole analysis, what it misses is that these benefits that people you know, report not liking <laughs> are benefits that don't really go to a lot of people. Uh, they mainly go to a very, very you know, small group of poor people. And of course, they're going to gain a stigma there. But if you create a different kind of benefit that's not exclusive to the poor, then, you know, odds are it's not going to have the same kind of stigma. And so I think the new child tax credit fits that mold as a, as a very clear welfare benefit. Check every month in your account, but not a poor people benefit. It's the first time we've done that in, oh man, <laughs> decades and decades and decades. I... So Sorry, I think I was muted for a second. Um, I there's some statistics that says something like you know ninety percent over ninety percent of Americans will receive some sort of government benefit in their lifetime, um, and that's any government benefit across the board. Obviously, for lots of people, that's Social Security. Uh, but because so many of these benefits, with the exception of Social Security and now this CTC, have been tied up in the tax code in these really like obscure, like kind of non-obvious ways, lots of people don't even realize they're getting help from the government. I mean, when you get your tax refund back, that just like, oh, cool, like that was my money or whatever. Uh, so I think that your point about, you know, like an actual check that is coming to people that they can see at, that that is, is a really good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, they used to, Suzanne Mettler has a phrase yeah. for this, the submerged state. And yep. You know, I mean, part of the justification for that was, you know, people don't want to feel like they're getting benefits. So you kind of <laughs> got to trick them into getting benefits. Um, and then also, you know, to kind of trick conservatives as well, you know, so that they, you know, if you can kind of pitch it as a tax cut, it might be a bit a bit more sellable to them. 
Um, but yeah, and I mean, I like I said, I, I think that that rationale, it, 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 you know, what they failed to account for in all this is they would look to benefits that were poor people benefits. They would look mm-hmm. to things like food stamps or WIC or school lunch or Medicaid to some degree, and you know, and then extrapolate from there. And in the American context, maybe you know, that's just kind of you feel like that's all you can do, and so mm-hmm. you say, well, we, you know, we need to try something else, but. In, a, in other contexts, it's like, if you really want to test this theory, we need to put out a benefit that is not exclusive to poor people and see if mm-hmm. that same kind of stigma attaches. And I don't know, I hope that uh, that won't be the case here. It's kind of hard to imagine that it would, you know, with the uh, 90% of kids getting it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, not, not, to, not to get you off on a tangent about the Nordic states, which I know, of course, is your other interest, but I mean, they their uh, their kind of system would seem to suggest that you do destigmatize uh, social services when they are available to a wider number of people, right? Absolutely, yeah, and I mean they've had a monthly child benefit. You know, I think Sweden was the first one to kick it off in like like 1915 or something like that. Like they've had this for over a hundred years, um, and yeah, it, you know, people like the welfare state there. It's it's so beloved that they've kind of made it their international brand. Um, you know, like we, we go out and talk about our great, you know, tech companies and innovation and they, they want to tell you about their baby boxes and stuff like that. <laughs> right, so. right. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I want to go back to the CTC because in your piece, you um, you do mention that uh, the CTC, the new CTC, for all of, you know, its kind of advantages that we just talked about, um, it was billed as something that would finally get benefits to the poorest people. And you mentioned that it doesn't actually do that. Um, and you don't spend a ton of time like kind of unpacking that in the piece. So I'm wondering if you can talk about why like why the benefits still aren't getting to the poorest of the poor and what kind of changes would need to happen to um, to make sure that they're getting those benefits. Yeah, so I wrote a lot of pieces about this when the uh, bill was being passed and I've written many since it's been passed and the basic problem here is we had this old child tax credit and the way it worked is at the end of the year when you filed your taxes they would look at how much income you had and you know, you'd get a certain benefit based on that. And the old benefit, it didn't go to poor people of course, if you don't file taxes you didn't get anything and if your income wasn't high enough for the credit to take effect, you didn't get anything e- either. So the old design was was meant to not go to poor people. And instead of saying, oh, hey, we're creating kind of a whole new benefit here that we do plan to go to poor people, let's rethink how we're doing this. They just said, we can kind of graft this on to the existing child tax credit program and just say, hey, if you don't file taxes, it's okay, we're, you're, you're still eligible. But the problem then becomes, okay, yeah, you're eligible, but how do you get the benefit? Mm -hmm. If you file taxes, they have your bank account number. They just put it in your account. I I got some in my account. I didn't do anything to get it. If you don't file taxes, they don't have any information like that. So now they, you know, non-filers, people who are too poor to file taxes, they have to now jump through a, a really considerable set of hoops to try to get this benefit, and, and they haven't been able to. And, and as I was saying when they were debating this bill, it was very predictable that they were not going to be able to do that. Um, as far as like what to do about it, my proposal from the beginning was let's have the Social Security Administration send this check out, just like they send out checks to some 70 million elderly and disabled people each month. And they actually send out checks, people don't know this, to about 3.5 million children each month um, because the, they, they, you are eligible for benefits if you're a disabled child or your parents die or, or something like that. And, and that would have made it much, m- much m- you know, easier to get. There are 1,500 Social Security offices around the country. Um, mm-hmm. People enroll in Social Security as soon as they're born, literally at the hospital. Their kids are put in it, and they get a Social Security number. So I thought that was a much more natural home for it. Uh, that's not where they went <laughs> with it. So now the question, uh, you know, they're probably not going to switch it over. So what can you do now? One, enroll kids at birth. Um, two... Uh, you know, hire some people to go out and try to find these people. Three, even though the Social Security Administration is not administering the benefit um, and and state welfare offices aren't, you could probably work with those offices to at least make it possible to sign up through them because Mm -hmm. they have thousands and thousands of locations across the country. Um, Right now, the only way to get it, if you're a non-father, you have to go through this website. Um, and very poor people, half of them don't even have computers at their home, um, mm-hmm. y- you know, and the website sucks and there's all sorts of problems with it. So, 
Yeah, basically trying to roll it out as close as you can to my initial proposal by kind of <laughs> allowing the existing welfare institutions where poor people do interact, where they do go sign up for food stamps and do sign up to get their disability checks, you know, try to try to make it as similar to that as possible. That's that's what I'm proposing. And they are going to have to make it permanent here in the next month or so with this new reconciliation bill. And I know there are people in Congress like Senator Brown and certainly Senator Sanders who are trying to make changes so that it will become more practical for mm -hmm. very poor people to sign up. Um, but I don't know if though, you know, how that's going to shake out. So I think uh, this is our last question for you, and then we will let you go go back to People's Policy Project. Um, but I was wondering, just again, on the subject of kind of uh, this uh, divide or like this difference between, you know, so-called poor people benefits and welfare benefits, um, do you see any other current poor people benefits that have the potential to be turned into kind of more general or larger welfare benefits uh, over, let's say, the course of the Biden administration. And then the very last question, uh, which I think kind of follows from that, and this is a little bit broad, so like answer how you want. Do you think this is the end, or do you think this is the beginning, at least, of the end of welfare reform? Yeah, so on the first question, <clears throat> just speaking practically based on, you know, the kind of things Biden might do, uh, the, the most obvious benefit is school lunch. Um, right now, for a long time, you could only get school lunch if your income was below a certain percentage of the poverty line or something like that. Um, and then in the Obama administration, they made it to where if your school had enough poor people in it or your school district had enough poor people in it, they just gave it to everyone in those schools without checking. Um, and that was, you know, an okay step. And then for the last year or two, they've been giving it to all, pretty much all kids because of the pandemic. Um, and they, they started giving people EBT cards because kids weren't going to school. Uh, so like for the last year or two, we've had you sort of like universal free school lunch. And, you know, uh, that seems like something you could make permanent. Uh, it's pretty small. It doesn't cost all that much. Um, so that would be the most practical thing, you know, within the confines of we have a moderate president and, you know, moderate Senate and all that. Mm -hmm. As far as the end of welfare reform, <coughs> it's an interesting question, you know, um, you know, they <coughs> what they should have done in 1996 when they got rid of aid to families with dependent children is they should have created a child allowance that just went out to everyone because the main problem with that old program was if you tried to work or earn any money, you would lose all those benefits. And that created a lot of problems for e people. E people wanted to work. They wanted to make more <laughs> money and then they couldn't and they kind of got in this welfare trap. Um, and so replacing it with something like this is what they should have done in 96 and now they've done it and it looks like they might make it permanent so in that narrow sense yes are we have we gotten sort of religion on universal benefits more generally one thing to look at on that is this new reconciliation bill in it they're going to try to do like child care benefits and paid leave benefits and things like that and so it'll be interesting to see if they design those in a way that's similar to like the new CTC or if they, or if it's still the old garbage. <laughs> and <laughs> right, I, so right. far it looks like it's just the old garbage. So we'll see. Well, the other, the other thing that I think about, um, of course, when I think about welfare reform is work requirements. Um, and luckily, like nobody, you know, so far as I know, like found some way to graft those onto the child tax credit. Although, as you point out, because of course, it is through the tax code that implies that you need some sort of income. Um, but I'm wondering, just as a follow up, like, do you see work requirements? Uh, I, I mean, you know, they're an issue again, of course, because, you know, now Republicans want to kick people off unemployment. Um, and I'm just I'm just wondering if you see any uh, opportunities or any space for progress to be made in that area. I mean, I think that everybody I think that like Democrats now actually you tell me do Democrats now and not just Bernie Sanders, but like Democrats like generally agree that well, that work requirements didn't work then and don't work now in terms of getting people back into the workforce. Um, I don't know. I don't. Th I yeah. mean, I think they. I think most, especially thinking in the policy world, most people think that these phased-in benefits we had, like the old child tax credit and then and the current earned income tax credit, that it does encourage people to work more because <clears throat> you know the more you work, the more benefit you get. Um, but it's weird because they they <laughs> they're very all over the map on this, and it really mm -hmm. kind of depends on the personalities involved. So like. When Trump was in office, 
of course, the Republicans, every time they're in office, they try to attach more work requirements to food stamps and Medicaid. Right. And the Democrats were furious about this. Oh, my right. God, you're going to throw all these poor people off their health insurance just because they can't get a job. What if they can't find a job? Even if they can't, whatever, like they're still sick. I, there was like this yeah. big kind of thing. And then you turn around and you say, well, uh, we should get rid of the earning income tax credit. It's pretty much the same kind of thing. If you can't get work, you can't get the earning income tax credit. We should fully they don't want to hear that right and so it's sort of like well wait which is it which one do we wh what do we want to attach this to or not and then with unemployment insurance you know right now all the GOP states have gotten rid of the uh, extra unemployment benefits they got rid yep. of them in the last month and the Democratic states they're all going to get rid of them in September 6 that's the schedule and the Biden administration could have stopped the Republican states from cutting some of the unemployment benefits. The way the statute was set out, they did not, uh, it, it actually obligates the Labor Department to pay these benefits. Um, and Biden could have tried to do something to get around that and like administer it directly, and he just chose not to. And it seems like they kind of are buying into this idea that unemployment benefits are, are holding uh, employment back. Um, right. So, you know. They'll probably let those expire in September 6th. And I had a piece up in Jacobin just yesterday saying that's there's 20 million people who live in households yeah. that are going to lose those benefits in September 6th. And it does it does not look like they're all going to be reemployed in that uh, in the next 40 days. So. Right. Yeah.